Jæja, kæru gestir, velkomin, bæði þau sem að fylgjast mér afrætt og þeir sem verður með okkur hérna í dag. Viðburðurinn fer fram á ensku og ég ætla að skipta núna yfir. Dear guests, I welcome you all to this uh, annual spring presentation event, one of our favorite events of the year. Uh, I hope it's going to be informative and a lot of fun. Uh, today, we give a warm welcome to some of our U.S. grantees who will talk about uh, their experiences in Iceland over the past months. We've heard from a number of U.S. scholars already at three smaller events. Uh, so today we have seven uh, of our fellows and scholars presenting. Uh, so we have a full afternoon. And I just want to note that the session is being recorded. Um, and that those who want to ask questions after each presentation, if you're not here in person, you can do that um, in the question box on Zoom. So, um, through Fulbright Iceland, we offer our outstanding grantees an opportunity to grow professionally, uh, as well as uh, personally. Being a Fulbrighter is a privilege, and grantees really take that responsibility to heart. Um, the grant period is a time for grantees to immerse themselves in the culture of Iceland, to learn new things, but also to share their knowledge and, um, and experiences from the United States. They're ambassadors. They work to increase mutual understanding between the US and Iceland. They build bridges, um, as well as collaborations and hopefully lasting friendships. Today, you know, um, we look forward to hearing about those experiences and their plans as their grant period will soon come to an end. We're very sorry for that. As I noted, we have seven presentations today. We have five student fellows and two scholars, uh, an impressive group of people from a variety of fields, and they're all engaged in interesting and impactful projects. It really is always a treat to hear about the diverse pro, uh, experiences and perspectives of our US grantees. So without further ado, I wanna get started. We're going to start the day with um, a group of our Fulbright fellows who are e either in a university program or engaged in research projects. Um, it can sometimes be hard to be the first one, but I'm sure that Brittany is up for the challenge. Uh, she comes to us from the University of California, Davis, and is here studying in the master's program in coastal communities and regional development at the University Center of the West Fjords up in Isafjordur. I know that she's been doing lots of volunteer work along with a full workload at the university. So I can't wait and I hope you feel the same to hear all about it. So Brittany, floor is yours. Thank you, Bonna, for that welcome. You uh, took a lot of what I was going to say on the very first slide anyways, uh, but I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing my experiences over the last nine months um, with all of you virtually and here in person today. So this is most of what Belinda just told you. I'm here from Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm, I'm, a military, I'm from a military family, but this is my hometown and where I was located before I came to Iceland. Um, I applied to Fulbright through my alma mater, which is University of California, Davis. That's where I graduated from in 2019, uh, followed by a year and a half of work with the um, Office of Planning and Sustainable Development in Hawaii. I was working there in the Explosive Zone Management Program and the Sustainability Branch. Um, and I applied for my grant uh, for the Coastal Communities and Regional Development Program at the University Center of the West Shores up in East of Fjordur. Um, in particular, this program because they focus um, in, my, in my field of studies with sustainability and with community planning, but, but with special attention and emphasis to rural communities, uh, which is something that I don't have a lot of personal or professional experience with. And so this was an opportunity to be able to address that. So just very briefly for those of you who uh, may not be as familiar with the West Fjords, we're in the Northwest part of Iceland. Um, I don't know if my cursor, it's not visible, okay. Uh, so the red pin that's not 
uh, dropped there is where I'm located. And this is a uh, overview that I took when I was very picking last summer <laughs> behind the avalanche fall, which is what that same structure is. This is a piece of gutter. Uh, and so then this is just an overview of some of the classes that I have been taking up uh, over the last nine months. I am actually still in a class. I'm in the adaptation planning uh, coursework and I took the day off to come down to Reykjavik for this presentation. Um, I won't go through all the details of everything that I've learned. Suffice to say that it has been quite a lot. Um, and one of the things that I've really enjoyed about this program that I also think speaks to uh, Iceland as a whole as well is it's a very international, very diverse program. Um, I have classmates and instructors who come from uh, multiple, I think we have three or four continents that are represented. We come from across Europe, from North America, uh, in the Arctic region. And so it's been a really, really great opportunity for me uh, be, to be able to meet my people and also to see um, case studies that are from places that I, I knew they existed, but I didn't know like the work that was being done there um, and how much I, I was surprised by the amount of overlap between things that would happen in regions that I, I wouldn't have thought would have similarities to a small tropical island in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, so that has been, um, it's been really, really good for me professionally to be able to see those resources. And also I think it's just representative of how Iceland sits at a crossroads for Europe and for the world, the connectivity that we have. Um, we have so many different opportunities that I, I wish I could take advantage of them all. So there are conferences in other countries. We have students who are in Lithuania and Latvia right now studying rural shrinkage, um, which I'm very excited to hear when they come back and share that. Uh, I got to participate in the Arctic Circle Assembly that was down here in Reykjavik in October as well. Um, and so that's just been, it's been very impressive um, uh, for me to be able to just be exposed to uh, these different opportunities. Um, also, for my, as I said at the beginning, my focus in coming here was for rural communities and, and rural development. Um, and so it's not been the exclusive focus of my program, but it is something that has come up quite a bit. And so just as one example of something that I picked up from this class, and it, it may sound obvious, but I guess for me, coming from the planning world, it was a bit of a paradigm shift. We had the, um, it was in a regional and rural economies class, uh, focusing on planning with decline or rural shrinkage as a condition, not something to be fixed, but rather something to work with. And so for me to be able to read about case studies that were being done in Sweden and in other parts of the Arctic, this was um, a little bit of an eye opener for me, basically. Uh, and so that's just one example of exactly the things that I was hoping for when I came to Iceland that I'm glad I was able to, to do. Um, and then before I move on to the next slide, as a personal note, I don't have a lot of, uh, this is my first time being able to live in a remote area and be able to have, um, it's not just news stories or something that's showing up in a research paper. And so this has also been helpful for me to think about my own assumptions and biases for rural communities, for example, back in the States, how I think about them and, and how I might interact with them in the future. So I won't go um, into too much detail here, but these are just some pictures of different class activities that we've been able to do. One thing that I really, really like about the University Center of the West Shores, um, partly because we're such a small program, is that the classes are very hands-on. We go out um, into towns around the West Shores, or like I said, we came to our for the Arctic Circle Assembly, and there's a strong emphasis in experiential learning um, and being able to have sort of personal connections to these material that we read about in class. So for example, I'm holding some Harthisker that I was gifted when we went to uh, Sudavik um, and was learning about some of the, the fishing communities around here. And it's just, um, it's been a really good way to collect the, uh, connect theory to practice. Um, I don't have time to go into full detail, unfortunately, but I do also want to highlight something that has been a high point for me as a Fulbright scholar here, or sorry, a Fulbright student. I was given the opportunity through the Fulbright Commission to attend the European Union NATO seminar back in March that took place in Brussels and in Luxembourg. Um, and we basically, we got to tour the European Union institutions. This is a photo from the European Court of Justice. Uh, we got to go to the NATO headquarters, and this was a chance to be able to meet 49 other Fulbrighters and Fulbright scholars that are across Europe. Um, and so just suffice to say, it was it was an amazing week. I, I really learned a lot about not just the European Union, but also the, um, the policies and work that are being done by NATO and the EU that I, again, wasn't even aware of. For example, um, opportunities for future career positions possibly at NATO that I would not have been the first place that came to mind when I was thinking of climate and sustainability work, for example. 
So I'm very grateful. I've said this to the commission before, but thank you again for allowing us to uh, having ISIM participate in this. And it was luck of the draw, so I can't take credit for being able to go, but I am so glad that I did. Um, and as we're starting to move to wrapping it up, I just, I've been able to do uh, different personal experiences, but just keeping in mind the theme for my grant with rural communities, um, I had the opportunity to spend part of my spring break with a classmate whose family owns a summer house in Snipeness Peninsula. And so this was, um, it, it wasn't meant to be a teaching experience or anything. We were just going uh, to enjoy the really good weather and she was showing me where she got to grow up and spend her summers. But it was, again, a, a good, personal connection to things that I've been learning about Iceland with the, the changes in development that has been going over the last decades with her uh, grandparents, for example, who used to own a farm. This is, this is looking out um, at their property from the summer house. Um, and they now live in the capital area. They had to sell parts of the property and move in. And so just to hear about the family development there, her own experience in spending the summers in Sampleness and the tourism development and the infrastructure development that's just happened. She's the same age as me, but just the development that's already happened in her lifetime. Um, and so besides just being a very nice and enjoyable, relaxing, beautiful views and amazing crowberry jelly from her grandmother, uh, it was also a nice uh, way to see, uh, again, have that personal experiences of things that I've been hearing about in my coursework. So this is just some of the other things that I've been doing in Iceland. I won't uh, go through many of the details of them. Uh, as Belinda mentioned, I have been doing some volunteer work. I'm doing a social media uh, science communication internship right now. Uh, some of the photos that were here, I've also used when I was um, working with a kindergarten class back in the States and was able to share about my experiences and holiday traditions. We were doing this over the winter. Um, and so there's a group of kindergartners somewhere out there in the middle of the ocean that is very excited about the Icelandic Yolakotrin uh, now. <laughs> so what's next for me? I am still in class. I will, uh, I'm finishing up next month uh, on June 9th, that'll be my last day. So we're still finishing that. I'm also in heading the student association at the university center. And so we're in the middle right now of planning an excursion trip that's gonna happen next week. So we're in the process for that. And then um, I'm just gonna be enjoying my last uh, month and a half that I have here in Iceland with some sightseeing that I'm looking forward to. And then this, uh, this August, I will be starting at the Yale School of the Environment in their environmental management master's program there. And so part of that experience requires doing a summer professional experience next year. Um, in between my first and second years. And so uh, with the networking that I've been able to do here in Iceland, um, I don't know yet what that professional experience is going to look like, but suffice to say, I am looking at multiple parts of the globe for the people that I have met here um, for opportunities to be able to do that. And then after that, it's into the workforce. And so I don't know yet where that's going to take me, but this Fulbright experience has reopened my mind to the possibility of international work and that even though work is for sustainability and community development is site specific, that doesn't mean that there aren't still lessons to be learned from other locations um, and really good examples to be able to follow and inspire us. So thank you. That our former minister of environment and current minister of social affairs, he got his uh, master's degree in environmental management at Yale as well. So yeah, um, I'm going to open it up. We have time for a couple of questions. If uh, anybody has a question, or on online, um, I can maybe just ask you. I mean, coming to East of here, that I always find, you know, for an American, it must be a uh, a bit of a shock in a way. What or I mean, it's so different from 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 life in most parts of the U.S. At least, what what surprised you most about Ethiopia? Well, I, I have to think about that for a second. I will say, um, I actually this is this isn't my first time living abroad, and actually, Iceland is the easiest place that I've been able to transition to so far. Mm -hmm. um, I do think part of that is the, the language I've been I've been doing. I tried to learn Icelandic. I took a course before I, I came to East of Further. I can't say I've been keeping up with it. Um, so it's very helpful that many people speak English here. <laughs> um, I think 
Okay, I'm sorry to stick there. The thing that surprised me the most when I got here, uh, and this I think was, it sounds negative, but I'll spin it in a moment. Um, I had a very idealistic idea of Iceland before I came. Uh, one of the reasons that I chose Iceland for one of my studies is because I had this impression of it being, uh, you know, a sustainability leader, and it is, it, it's doing a lot of really great work mm -hmm. in there, but for example, I came to East further and learned that partly because of infrastructure challenges, they released wastewater straight out into the fjord, which was not something that I would have expected, I guess, in my little fantasy idea of what Iceland was. Uh, but one of the positive things I think that comes out of it is, again, it, it kind of worked both ways. Not only did I realize there are things that can be learned from other countries and in other places to apply to Hawaii, but also I kind of came abroad, not just in Iceland, but in general to Europe, sort of as feeling almost apologetic in a way as I'm coming from the states and I'm aware of some of our reputation and our track records but it's nice to be able to find out that at least like with my professional experiences that I've had I do have something to offer and it can be a mutual exchange of information um, and, and support it doesn't have to just be one way absolutely I mean Iceland is not perfect but and none of us are perfect right and that's one of the things that we've learned in an exchange like this um so I spent a little time for us here at SU. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the avalanche wall outside of East Florida. Yes. Um, I think when I think about Iceland, I just think that the volcanoes immediately come to mind. Mm -hmm. um, but I've just kind of been learning more about avalanches. Avalanches are really like the most dangerous natural phenomenon we have. And I think it was in 1995. Yes. Two really, really deadly avalanches up there in the West Coast. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious with you both studying community development and planning and living up there in the West Coast. Like, what does avalanche preparation look like for you both in this? very steep elements. Right. So the two avalanches that he's talking about um, were in 1995 in Suvereri and, uh, no, Sudevik and, and Fateri. I mix up the two, two of the towns. Um, but though, so I, I was able to go and we went for a class excursion. I just go back very briefly. Um, this class excursion here in the bottom, bottom right is from the uh, meteorological office that's based out in the West Fjords. And we actually got to speak with one of the staff members there who was one of the very first people on the scene in Fnathari during the novel. And she was involved with the recovery and rescue efforts there. So we got to hear about his personal experiences um, for, for what that was like. And um, I don't, I can't say for sure what the Islanders mentality to it, um, with, I can't speak to it with any sort of authority, but it, if there's one natural, it's one of the only natural disasters in the West Shorts that consistently comes up with planning because of the constraints that it makes for available land, the idea of risk, what's acceptable to live with. Um, and in my class that we're doing right now, actually in climate adaptation, where nobody in that class, the instructor nor us are Icelandic. So we're kind of looking at it from an outsider's perspective and how Iceland talks about climate change or doesn't and how it appears. And so that's been kind of an interesting um, connection point, I guess, for us is, is avalanches and kind of how to pull that into other aspects of climate change, like precipitation and sea level rise. So I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. and, um, one of the things that we've noticed so much is this beginning influx of tourism mm -hmm. and thinking of 3 million people visiting 380,000 people right. and thinking about everyone wants to see the environment. Mm -hmm. Does that play in at all to some of the work you're doing? in terms of thinking about how to protect and make it available at the same time or accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, just for the uh, people who are tuning in, if you couldn't hear the question, it was about tourism uh, with the many millions of tourists that are coming to Iceland compared to small uh, small local population and how people who are coming for environmental tourism and the environmental impacts, how that works with planning. So it is something that's definitely being talked about a lot in the West Fjords, especially because it's uh, it's still, relatively on the fringes for tourism, but it's up and coming, especially in East Africa, there we have many cruise ships that are announcing themselves loudly now that the, 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 the season has started. Um, I don't have answers for that, of course. I just know that um, it's, it's the same conundrum that we're facing in a way in Hawaii of large number of people. How do you, like, who has, not rights to be able to see it, but like, how do you manage who gets to access it, um, balancing the economic affairs. My personal perspective anyways, is swapping one in, uh, depend industry dependency for another single industry dependency 
is not a good idea to go forward. And so that is definitely something that's being talked about in the West where just like in many places is economic diversification as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just curious more about the program that you're in and like how mm -hmm. many students there are and sort of where they're from and mm -hmm. what your relationships to them might look like going forward. Mm -hmm. So my my program, which is the Coastal Communities and Regional Development, we are 10 students, I think, but the University Center has two sister programs. And so the other one is Coastal Coastal Marine Management is the name of the other one. And they're 20-ish students or so. Plus um, with the connectivity that I was talking about before, we have Erasmus students that will come through. Um, we also have other international organizations who will sometimes take classes with us but otherwise they take classes like parallel to us and we exist like in the same space and connect socially that way um so it's, it is a small program i have a lot of repeat classes with some of my classmates but it's really great because they, they bring um we have students from across europe we have someone who's there from india we have people from north america um, a few of us from the states of course that are there and so everybody's bringing in um their different professional experiences. There's some really cool, interesting backgrounds that people have brought to the program. Um, and so I just, I get, because I have a small program and repeat classes, I get to hear over the course of the year, different aspects that come up in classes and, and kind of learn from that and who to follow up with, like uh, outside of class, for example. Um, I'm still processing everything that I've been learning over the last few months here. Um, and I think I'm going to continue to do that as I go back to the States. And so I uh, I have definitely, um, both with the EU NATO seminar and with my classmates, been able to make friends, professional connections. My LinkedIn network has expanded quite a bit since I, heard, since I landed here. And so um, it's just, we're all, especially in the coastal program, we all have very similar interests. And so uh, I don't know how, but I know that we will be really good resources going forward. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Okay, I think that's gonna have to be it for, for now, but thank you so much. Great start to our day. Yeah, so next up is Bethany, graduate of Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. Her fascinating independent research project is on life cycle assessment of Iceland's aluminium production process, and she's hosted by Reykjavik University. I know that Bethany is a sportswoman who loves the outdoors and has been put, taking full advantage of all of this uh, here in Iceland, so I'm going to invite her to take the floor and tell us all about her stay. All right. Yes. Yeah, so as Belinda mentioned, I graduated from Swarthmore last year and I'm hosted here by Reykjavik University. And my project this year was a life cycle assessment of inert anodes in aluminum production in Iceland. So to start off, I'm just going to offer a quick definition of a life cycle assessment from the European Environmental Agency. Um, and some of the main things to highlight here are that, as the name implies, you have to take into account the entire life cycle of a product when doing these analyses. And so a phrase that people hear a lot associated with this is like cradle to grave. So you think about a product from its production all the way to its eventual detention. And then another important part of this definition here is using it to study environmental impacts using this tool, this model. So in my case, I'm using this tool of the life cycle assessment to study the environmental impacts of aluminum production, specifically in terms of inert anodes, which is the technology I'll get into again in a second. So first of all, I thought it would be helpful to give a quick background on aluminum production, uh, specifically in Iceland. So there are five main stages, one could say, to aluminum production. You can see them here on the screen in this diagram. The first one is mining of raw material called bauxite, or bauxite, some people say. Um, and this occurs mainly in countries along the equator. So Brazil is a big one with a lot of bauxite resources. Australia is another big one. And then also Guinea is another country that has a lot of um, resources in this area. And so bauxite is a combination of a lot of kind of elements and minerals, aluminum being one of them, but to pull it out, it has to go through a good few other stages. So next it's sent to refining. And what comes out of that process is something called alumina, which is aluminum oxide. 
And this becomes the raw material for smelting, which is what happens in Iceland. There are three main smelters in Iceland. And the reason why smelting happens in Iceland is because it's a highly energy intensive process. And energy or electricity, as we know here in Iceland, is pretty clean and pretty cheap. So countries that need a lot of this energy um, or companies that need a lot of this energy have kind of found their way to Iceland for aluminum smelting. So then the smelting process, which I'll get into the specifics in a second here, produces pure aluminum, which can then be used and then hopefully recycled so it can go right back into the use phase and skip that whole energy intensive process. So there are, well, there's really one main process used in smelters industrially right now, and that's called the hull hero process. And that was developed in the late 1800s. And since its development, it's been pretty much the only industrial option to produce aluminum. This process took aluminum from being considered like a rare precious metal to being a commodity we kind of see across production chains now. And so, in this process, this material alumina, this aluminum oxide is dissolved in a really high temperature um, solution around 970 degrees Celsius. And then an electrical current is applied and that electrical energy is used to kind of break up the chemical bonds in this aluminum oxide and produce pure aluminum. And so an anode is something in electrolysis that is used to provide an electric current. And in the hull hero process, these anodes are made of carbon. And so what that means is that during the smelting process, uh, these carbon anodes are actually used up and the carbon combines with the oxygen that's being removed from the aluminum and is directly released as carbon dioxide. So that's kind of a direct emission associated with aluminum production that you can't really get rid of, even if your energy is completely clean. So the kind of other side to this is this dream of inert anodes. And the word inert just means non-reactive or it doesn't participate in the reaction. Um, and these are still in development, still in research. The hopes is that in the next few years, they'll be able to use, be used industrially. And so the kind of advantage here is that instead of producing carbon dioxide in the process, you'd actually be producing oxygen. Um, the trade-off is that oxygen and these other kind of compounds produced are higher energy chemical um, molecules. And so that might increase the energy requirements of an already very energy intensive process. So what I was working on um, over these last many months was trying to get just a better sense of this process and a better picture of what a transition to inert anodes might look like. And I used a life cycle assessment as the tool. To do that. So this is how I kind of split up my work. I split it also into five stages. The first one was a retrofit of the kind of existing smelter cells, because if we wanted to transition the technology, there would be a certain amount of redesigning of the cells to kind of accept it that would need to happen. Um, and also in this retrofit, hopefully it would then avoid that um, energy increase that I kind of talked about the last slide. So that was something I looked into. I looked into the actual production process for the anodes. I focused on metal anodes. There's a few other categories that are kind of in research right now. But I focused on a simple kind of metal alloying process for them. You also need to worry about cathodes in an electrolysis process, which is just the kind of counter component to anodes that works with the current um, distribution. And so that was another step that I had to take into account for my life cycle assessment. Next, I looked at the use phase itself, which is this electrolysis stage. And in this phase, I'll get into this in the next slide, but I, just to kind of look at all scenarios, I tried a bunch of different energy mixes to see what would be the effects there. And then finally, a recycling phase. And this recycling phase actually is a recycling of the anodes themselves, not the aluminum products. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the layout of my, my life cycle. So I wanted to pull out some results. The software that I use gives you like dozens of environmental impact categories. So I was trying to pick one that maybe would be the most, um, yeah, just kind of familiar to people. So this is a graph of the global warming potential of 15 different scenarios that I was looking at. So the scenarios I chose use um, kind of alternating energy requirements to kind of 
predict maybe what would happen with that ideal energy requirement versus an elevated one that could be the case. I looked at many different energy mixes from hydropower to just using straight coal to like all of these other ones. Um, and then I again compared the inert anodes to two base cases, so scenarios of the hall hero process. This is what I found. I would say the most interesting kind of result that I pulled out of this graph was comparing scenario two and scenario five, or sorry, scenario six. Um, and what those are saying basically is that even if we are dealing with an elevated energy requirement for inert anodes, it's actually not producing more carbon dioxide equivalent as we maybe thought it could have. Um, so again, this is like the first stage of the model and I, I can't say that it's, it's fully nailed down yet. There's definitely future work to be done, but that was an interesting result for, for this first stage of the project. So these are some of my research related highlights, I would say. Um, I'll start with this first picture up in the top left. I was able to visit two of the smelters here in Iceland during my time here. Um, one of them was the Fjordal smelter out in the east in Egilsstaðir, and that one was very cool to go to because it was very far away from here. So it kind of doubled as a sightseeing visit. Um, it's also one of, I think it is the largest one in Iceland. So that was a, a cool trip to be able to to go on. And then next in the top middle here, I was able to attend meetings and also give a presentation at Arctis Metals, which is a company in Iceland that is kind of spearheading the research and development for inert anodes in Iceland. There's a few different kind of joint ventures around the world that are trying to get this to be industrially ready and Arctis is the one. Um, this photo <laughs> was taken during a trip that I took with my research group to the Agricultural University. We were there to look into kind of potential future partnerships and things like that. And we went on a lovely walk in the morning and I sunk up to my ankles in mud and I just thought that was a fun picture. <laughs> and then these last two at the bottom are two of my main probably academic outcomes for the year, I guess you could say. So I had a poster that was able to be presented a few weeks ago at a conference in Vienna. And then I've submitted a manuscript and I also have a presentation at another conference coming up in June. So those were both kind of exciting outcomes. Um, let's see what's next. Yeah, so then I wanted to just go over a few of the challenges that I had, but also what I kind of learned from them and what I took away from that. So the first thing I have here says project direction, but maybe project timing would be a bit of a better phrase because I mentioned early on that this technology is still really in its development phase. And so what I ran into a lot of is just I needed numbers and statistics that don't exist yet. Um, so I was trying to like add things into my model like, oh, what are the like precise emissions for this part of the process? And people were like, oh, we don't we don't know yet. We're still trying to figure that out. Um, so then what, what ended up happening is I was able to build this model that has a lot of good kind of estimations and it's a framework that's really significant. And so then in future years, as more information becomes available, it's really easy to just plug it in and like refine the results much more. So that's exciting in terms of um, possible extensions of future work. Next challenge, I just said light. And I think that one is kind of a general experience of a lot of people moving to Iceland. I'll get into a little bit on my last slide where I talk about my personal kind of experiences on how I learned to kind of combat that. But um, the one positive thing that I, or there were, there were a few positive things about the winter, but one of them is that I was able to see beautiful sunsets like this on like an early afternoon walk. So that was nice. And then finally, I have this on the challenges slide because I wasn't sure quite where else to, to put it. But when I got here at the beginning of my time, I wasn't sure what I was doing. Um, afterwards, I had some ideas. Maybe I would look for a job back in the States. Maybe I would be interested in going on to more education. Um, so it was definitely a bit of a challenge to try to figure that out while also try to do this research project here. Um, but I feel really lucky and excited to have found a cool master's program here that I'm actually going to be pursuing for the next two years. So that is the Sustainable Energy Engineering Program at Reykjavik University. Um, so yeah, excited. And then my last 
slide here is just some fun pictures of my time. Um, I'm going to start with this running photo up in the top left, just because it also includes two fellow Fulbrighters. Um, and also, this is the one picture I chose to represent my kind of running in Iceland, but that's really a bigger kind of portion of my experience than this one picture can represent. Um, I was not a runner before I came here, but here we are now. And really what this what this picture comes from is, is Sydney and I were able to join a, a running group here. And going back to talking about the winter, that group really became a really significant thing because it was something that like three times a week, I knew I had a social and outdoor activity that I could go to. Um, and yeah, that was that was just huge. And it also became a community of Icelanders that I was able to get to know, which I had been struggling to kind of find outside of that. Um, so that was a very big part of my experience for sure. A lot of these are hikes. I love hiking. It's a great country for hiking. Um, oh yeah, and I was able to take an, an Icelandic class um, in my first semester here. That was something that was pretty important to me was to try to like learn a little bit of the language. And I did some of it on my own before I got here, but um, this class was definitely helpful and it was cool to be able to meet other people that were also here trying to learn the language. So that was some cool connections as well. Yeah, I think that about takes us to what I wanted to cover. So I guess a final thank you to my advisors who are maybe here. Yes, I see at least, yes, I see them both. Okay, who are here on Zoom. Um, <laughs> So Gruber Severstadter and David Finger were my advisors for this project and they were extremely helpful in many, many ways. And then also obviously the Fulbright Commission, you guys have been amazing. So yes, thank you all very much. So do you have an idea that, do you have a sense of like in the next decade or so will all of them become more environmentally friendly in terms of technology? Sure. Yeah. So I think a decade is definitely a reasonable kind of goal at the moment. There's a few, like I said, there's a few different like um, areas around the world that are, are working on it. One year I heard was 2025, 2024, people were trying to at least demonstrate industrially that it would be possible. Um, but something that is really important to mention is that a like 70% of the like emissions from the entire process of aluminum production come from the electricity mix input. So in Iceland, that's minimized because it's powered by hydropower. Um, but in other countries that are doing a ton of aluminum smelting, China would be a big one that have um, not quite as clean energy mixes. That's really a huge source of the problem. So this research is like interesting and really significant and is like the only way to get to kind of zero emissions for aluminum production. But there's also a lot of work that just needs to be done in the energy sector too. To yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so hydro is actually one, three, and four. Those are the hydro power. Yeah. This is concept of like, you know, we continue mm -hmm. the same amount of aluminum smelt. How many tons, millions of tons per year is this reduction? If we could switch right now. Sure. So I think the percentage, if we're looking at Iceland, which would be the hydrogen, or sorry, the hydropower, um, I believe the percentage between kind of these two scenarios is something around like a 50, uh, 40 to 50% decrease. So I'm not sure in terms of um, absolute numbers what that is right now, but in terms of percentage, that's what it would be. And most of that is coming from one, the direct emissions that I talked about. And there's also, if you can see the box here, a good amount of carbon emissions coming from also manufacturing the carbon atoms. So those would be the two main sources that you'd be able to. Yeah. Yes? I think the reason why
Yeah, that's a great question. So there's additional research being done on that because part of the problem with using that for aluminum production is that the let me make sure I can explain I can explain this correctly. The percentage of carbon dioxide in the gas that's taken away from the aluminum plant is really low. So it's a lot of carbon dioxide over a course of time, but it's not a very concentrated amount. And so that doesn't work well with current carbon capture technology. So there's also research being done to try to figure out if we can like um, up concentrate that percentage and then use it with carbon capture. But right now it, that's also kind of being looked into, but it's not, yeah, it, it, there would be some tweaks that need to happen. Last question, last question. Okay, so <laughs> I'm curious what you're more sort of passionate about, the aluminum or the life cycle assessment? If it's the great question. maybe like what's another example of something that you That yeah, that's a really good question. So I think it's it is more the kind of modeling techniques. That was what I came in like when I was looking to set up a project, I emailed a bunch of professors here and I was like, I want to learn more about modeling. Like, what do you have? <laughs> and um so the aluminum kind of came up in the process of that. I've grown to be really interested in it, certainly. Um, but I do think that in terms of like personally what I'm into, it's more like environmental impact assessment and those kinds of things. Um, man, other examples like anything, like any product that we use has effects that are hard to like quantify by just looking at them, unless you like take into account its manufacture and then also its decommission. So yeah, personally, I'm not sure. There's so much in Iceland also that's interesting. I've thought about looking at like greenhouses here and how those kind of have a, also a life cycle and like what that would look like. Um, so maybe that's a future project, but we'll see. Yeah. Well, thank you so Great. much. Yes. So yes, next we're going to hear from Sydney who applied to Fulbright Iceland through California State University, Fresno. And uh, she's also doing research at Reykjavik University, also on an important topic the atmospheric fallout of microplastics. And I know that you've also been volunteering and taking part in local activities and stimulating cultural exchange, all that good stuff. So let's hear what Sydney has to tell us. Hi everyone, um, both here presently and on Zoom. My name is Sydney, as Belinda said, I come from California State University, Fresno as my home institution. And currently I am studying Atmo atmospheric transport of microplastics at Reykjavik University. It's been a long journey from uh, the Californian who showed up back in August, um, not knowing what she signed up for to come to the most northern capital city in the world. Um, little did I know that that would possibly be the warmest day of the year. And now, <laughs> now we are here, um, not only surviving, but thriving in this country. And so here is kind of walking through my journey. It all starts out with possibly the biggest April Fool's joke that anyone has ever played on me by both the United States government and the Icelandic government. When I received a letter um, on April 1st, 2022, that I had been promoted from an alternate to a finalist, and that I would be coming to study um, the atmospheric fallout of microplastics, their transport and deposition to remote areas um, under the direction of Dr. Flinner Stefansson, who I see is on the, on the call right now, and Dr. Einar Jon as Johnson. Um, basically, the reason that I chose this to study um, and reached out to Cleaner to study under him is microplastics have so like so great impacting effects both on climate health and human health. And something that we're really looking at in Iceland, along with a lot of other very great research teams, is how do the microplastics get to such pristine remote areas that human activity is just not present in such as Vatnajökull ice cap, which was the center of my proposed study in Iceland. Um, and the primary mechanism of transport that is suspected is through atmospheric deposition, either through dry deposition, which is basically microplastics are picked up in the wind, they're blown all over the world and deposited in these remote areas, or through wet deposition, AKA rain, um, snow, sea currents, and the like. So the original plan was that I was going to come here we were going to go to Vatnajökull, collect some samples, bring them back, analyze them, and kind of look at the profiles of these microplastics. 
I am going to go over my challenges slide a little early. Um, as you can, some of you can tell who have been here, um, during the winter time, Iceland is not a place where car travel is um, something that you can just go and do. And so the expedition to Vatnajökull had to be put off a little bit. Um, but instead, like any good research team, we adapt, we pivot, we move on to some different amazing projects that I was able to work at um, in my time here. Um, so my capstone project while I've been in Reykjavik has been a systematic review looking at the physical characteristics of microplastics that have been deposited in remote regions versus urban regions where are thought, which are thought to be, well, which are the center for their production and of those polluting factors that make their way into the more remote regions, such as, as Vatnajökull. We're looking at the sizes, the shapes, um, the colors um, and the comp polymer compositions. You might ask why the colors. Um, well, some of the darker microplastics have um, positive net radiative effects um, that we found, which basically means that they can increase the snow melt, which of course is a very grave concern for the environment. Um, so we're trying to pinpoint if we can find patterns um, in the different characteristics and the ones that have been true. Uh, transported to those remote regions. While we're still in the publication process, I can't reveal those results, but I can say we have found some significant differences in the different characteristics. I was also able to start a really cool project looking at the limitations of the different analytical techniques, such as spectroscopy, um, and how small they are able to detect those microplastics. I'm sure a lot of you in the audience have heard that microplastics have now infiltrated a lot of human body systems. Um, these microplastics that infiltrate those systems are primarily those that are 10 micrometers and below in size. Um, and microplastics can be anywhere from one micrometer to 5,000 micrometers in size. Conversely, the analytical techniques that are most accessible around the world um, can normally only detect down to about 25 micrometers in size. So this will be another systematic review to see if we can find the most effective and also accessible techniques um, to detect these microplastics that are of the smallest kind, as those are the ones that we haven't really been able to pinpoint their concentration in the environment at the moment, but it is very important that we do so very quickly. Um, a final project that I've been able to help out on, um, Dr. Joseph Fowley and Glennie Hewman, um, both of Reykjavik University, Glennie's a master's student, is the development of a drone-based sampling technique, which is primarily um, has been made in order to reduce some of the plastic contamination um, and other types of contamination that is introduced through manual sampling of um, freshwater samples for microplastics. Of course, um, one of the biggest parts of the Fulbright Fellowship and what makes it so special sets it apart from all other fellowships is the emphasis on cultural exchange and being an ambassador um, in the community. Um, this is a cat with um, the cutest Christmas costume that we saw um, back in December, and I thought it was an excellent representation of um, kind of my time here in Iceland. So first I'm going to talk about um, Arguably, one of my biggest um, cultural introductions into Iceland was this running group that I joined called Loigaskok. Um, when I started my time in Iceland, I had run cross country and track in college, had some ups and downs, and was really looking to repair my relationship with the sport when I came here. So I saw there was a half marathon happening in spring, reached out to some other pool writers, said, hey, let's run this marathon, let's set this goal. Um, and then I realized I needed a team to train with. I'm not someone who likes to just go out on runs by myself. Um, I really miss that social aspect. So I was directed to Loida Stock through a Facebook group as you're directed to most things um, in Iceland. Um, little did I know that I would be running through craters and signing up for um, runs that would take me through mountains of elevation and that I would come to have 40 to 50 basically Icelandic aunts and uncles who would really integrate me into the community here. A really interesting um, part of my Icelandic experience that I feel is really fulfilling and I want to integrate back home is anti-consumption culture or community reliance. There were a lot of really cool grassroots projects that I not only got to observe, but I got to take part in. Um, on the left, we have a picture of some amazing baked goods. Um, this is from the free supermarket run by Andrimi, 
which is a local grassroots non-political organization in downtown Reykjavik. And Andrini is kind of the head of a project called Frige, um, which is the word free and fridge smushed together um, in a cool slang type of way. And there are these locations kind of around the city of Reykjavik where when people maybe say they um, order too much catering or have other safe, um, safely packaged foods that they are not going to have um, for use, such as pantry stables, they can leave them in these refrigerators, which are placed through the city. And it's kind of a first come first serve basis. I thought this was an amazing food security initiative um, that the Icelandic community has taken upon itself. Um, this was at the free supermarket, which every Friday Andrimi opens its doors and gives out free bread and pastries. Um, to anyone who comes through. Um, these are from local bakeries, Broad Co. and Greek Bakery. And on the right, um, we have my first purchase, so to speak, from the Swap Iceland Facebook group. This is another cool grassroots organization of the community where basically if people are moving away or have some sort of spring cleaning event, um, they have things in their house that maybe they don't want to go through the hassle of buying and selling online, um, they will post these things online will say, give me some offers, maybe some food, um, maybe some shampoos and such. Um, I got this bike in exchange for a dozen carrot cake muffins at the beginning of my time here. And so I thought this was an amazing way um, to kind of like help for economic security, food security and the like. And I really hope to implement this into the communities that I continue to reside in in the future. Um, these are some special friends that I want to highlight. Um, on the left, we have Sarah and Sebastian. They were my first semester roommates. They came from Sweden. Sebastian was an Erasmus student at Reykjavik University studying science, and Sarah accompanied him here. We were all kind of navigating our first time away from home for an extended period of time, what life was going to be like as an international student. And we both partook in some new um, Icelandic traditions as well as Swedish and American traditions, so we didn't get too homesick. And we went Northern Lights hunting together every night, um, and they were the perfect roommates for the first semester. I also had an amazing roommate second semester who's in the audience tonight, Selma. Um, Selma is Danish and Icelandic, although I put the Iceland flag to represent her because I feel like she was the piece that made me finally feel like at home as an Icelander. Um, I finally felt like I really knew what it meant, um, what it was like to go about a day in the life as an Icelander. And um, in addition to that, she's been one of the best friends, one of the best support systems I've had here. Um, I've just seen myself grow um, into such a different person since I've come to know her. And I can't thank her enough for that. Obligatory nature posts because we are in Iceland, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Um, I just can't believe the the top um, left and right pictures as well. Never in a million years did I think I would ever be somewhere this cold where waterfalls would freeze. Um, but here we are. Um, regardless, I had a lot of amazing friends who made sure that I went out and experienced nature, even though it was much colder than the 20 Celsius that we're used to in California at the coldest. Um, and this is a picture of my walk to school. Um, this was my first time living in a snowy environment. And so that was a challenge, um, but it was a fun challenge. And I feel like I'm a much stronger, more confident person um, where I'm not just like hiding from the weather, but I've learned how to embrace it in my time here. Um, as a way to capture, document all of these um, amazing adventures, we became first in the 0.5 selfie. So here are some of my favorites from the year. Um, I want to um, point out the one on the right, um, the top right, which is our sunrise hike that we did back in January, um, which sunrise hikes can be a challenge in the States, but luckily it was not a challenge here because this picture was taken at 11.30 a.m. <laughs> Through the Fulbright Commission, I've been able to take part in some traditions, both old and new, um, from carving loith red um, to cracking open some chocolate Easter eggs, um, participating in bolu daga, I may have said that wrong, I apologize, um, but a tradition before Easter, Easter, very tasty that the Fulbright Commission treated us to. The Airwaves um, concert, this was maybe one of my favorite events of the year. The entire city turned into a concert venue for three days, and I got to listen to some Icelandic and international artists who I had never heard of before and have now taken over my Spotify rap, um, the evil Christmas cat, um, 
I think the picture kind of explains itself there, my thoughts on that, but still a very interesting tradition. And finally, um, really getting to get down and dirty in nature um, and take part in the inaugural planting of the Fulbright Forest, which I'm excited for fellows and scholars for years to come will get to also take part in. I have had such an amazing year here. And fortunately, um, I'm excited to announce today that my time is not over. Um, during this fall, I will take part in the inaugural cohort of the Reykjavik University Master's in Science in Digital Health Technologies program. This program will take um, different computer science aspects such as AI and machine learning and learn and take them and apply them in medical applications to digitize not only the Icelandic healthcare system, but also communities around the world. I'm excited to use this program as a way to continue collaboration with both Icelandic and United States medical institutions, as well as um, to continue investigating the impacts of microplastics on both climate health and human health. I can't thank the Fulbright Commission enough um, for their um, support of this year that has been nothing short of transformative. I'm very excited for the years to come, and I'm so glad I got to do it along with this lovely group, along with this lovely group of people and my amazing advisors. Again, thank you so much for everyone who has supported me in this journey. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Thank you. Fabulous, so great. And I'm just hearing everybody and how this year has transformed them and given them so much. It's just very warming to us at the right to hear all of it. But let's open up to questions now. Um, who wants to start? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. So initially during my time here, I came into um, Fulbright, the Fulbright Iceland program, actually as a way to spend a productive year or a few years um, in between undergraduate and medical school. Um, and when I came here, I expected that I would be here for one year, conduct some really cool research, and then I would move back to the States. I would maybe shadow some clinicians for a year, and during that time, I would apply for medical school. Um, that has since changed. Um, not only have I gotten to have the amazing experience through the Fulbright program, but I've also gotten to work very closely with the Stanford Orthopedics program um, since graduation. And through those two programs and the amazing mentors that I've had there, they've really inspired me to take a look further into the need, um, kind of how the we can see the world is transforming at a pretty rapid rate with everything going on with chat GPT and other AI um, API formats. And so what I am hoping to do is to build up those skill sets so that when I do um, prospectively become a clinician or work in some way in the medical field, that instead of competing with the AI that I can use it in order to best optimize um, the care that I'm able to provide my patients. So with the microplastics in my do you think that, I mean, that's just going to increase and do you have any sense of what impact that might have on the issue? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a lot of different impacts that we're looking at. So as you can imagine, there's the impact that it will have on the glacier itself, which like what I um, spoke about, about the surface albedo effects, um, the net radiative, force, um, net radiative effects, that it can increase melting of the glacier. Um, which not only will lead to situations such as what we've unfortunately experienced with the OK Glacier, with it um, completely melting, um, but also with rising sea levels. Um, that's something else we have to look into as well is the biota that this will affect. Um, so as the glacier melts or as the microplastics from the glacier are picked up and further deposited through the atmosphere in other ways, um, we have to look at the effects on life that that will have. Um, they've already found microplastics in not only human species, but in many um, Icelandic biota as well. Um, and so also ocean acidification is another concern. So there are a lot of major, major, again, both climate and human health concerns um, with the effects of microplastics. Because the field of research is relatively new, at least it's become relatively popular within the last five years. We don't have a lot of data yet on the long-term effects of those health, but 
there's already been studies that have shown cytotoxic or cell toxicity, um, inflammation, even um, tumor causing effects in some other species. And so it's something that we need to continue to monitor for sure. I was very interested in this Fridge project that yes. you got me involved in, and it's a great idea, mm -hmm. it sounds like, uh, to minimize food waste and help those in need. Yes. But how, uh, just can you say a little bit more about how it works in terms of, can anyone just put something in mm -hmm. the fridge, and what if somebody were to put something in there that yes. was not done in mm -hmm. a beneficial, in a beneficial way. way. Yes. yes. And that's another thing about this project mm -hmm. is since it is very community run, it is kind of independent and in that there are some people from under me that of course do go and monitor it. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, there is really nothing um, preventing someone from putting something in there that isn't good to eat or could cause damage. And that's part of the community um, I don't want to say accountability, but that's sort of something that I want to study further is how we could implement this in the states where it's monitored and regulated, because I think that's a big challenge in the states that mm -hmm. people are not so willing to take on these projects because it has to go through all of these different regulations. and You have to have someone who's monitoring it and you have to have someone who's testing it. So that would be actually a really cool side project that I would love to take on within the next two to three years. Um, so that when I do um, potentially return to the States or even just through con uh, continuous um, international work, uh, collaborative work, that we would find a way to implement that where it's both safe and um, accessible and people are able to take it on from a grassroots perspective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All of you guys are so inspiring. Okay, so final speaker before the break, Eric, who did his undergraduate work at Rice University in Texas. As you see, we have diversity in terms of geographic location in the US. Um, he's our Ministry of Culture grant recipient uh, to study Icelandic as a second language at the University of Iceland. And I, he, I don't know if he'll mention this, but just in case he doesn't, during um, his first semester, he earned first class distinction with honors across the board and top marks on his final exam. And of course, we're expecting no less in the spring, but uh, let's hear about his experiences this year. Thanks for that uh, introduction, Linda. Um, so I'm Eric Marr, I'm the Ministry of Culture grantee for studies in Icelandic as a second language. Um, so my grant is jointly funded by both Fulbright and the Art de Magnuson Institute for Icelandic Studies. Um, Dr. Bronislav Bedi um, has been very helpful to me this year um, from Um, I'm on a really unique grant. Um, I don't know. I think I asked Linda this. I don't know how many Fulbrights there are that pursue a bachelor's degree. Um, so it's pretty cool to be on something that's, that's truly unique like that um, and to learn Icelandic. So I'd like to start by looking backwards a little bit. Um, I first came to Iceland in 2021, and I took a short summer course in Icelandic language and culture at the University of Iceland. Uh, I also worked on a, a farm up in the West Fjords a month after that. Um, and I wanted to stay, but uh, there are pesky things like international visa laws that you have to follow along with. So I went back to the States and I was living in Seattle, Washington before I moved here. Um, so I spent a lot of time at the National Nordic Museum. Um, I kind of had Iceland on my mind all the time. On one of my visits, I took a picture of this exhibit at the Nordic Museum, which I think is very Icelandic in its directness and its sentiment. I'm going to get out of this place. It's too cold. Um, I think it's much more relatable after a winter here. Um, I was also teaching. I was teaching theology, uh, a class on the Old Testament while I was living there. And at the end of the year, um, some of my students gave me teacher reviews. Um, and this one girl, Cora, bless her heart, said I was a 10 out of 10 teacher. Um, apparently, I hadn't seen enough Disney movies. I was a negative 10 out of 10 Disney fan, <laughs> but I was a 12 out of 10, a mathematically impossible Icelandic historian. Um, I, I don't fully know how I managed to bring up Icelandic history when I should have been talking about the Book of Job and Ecclesiastes, but I did. Um, and uh, I think it just goes to show I, I couldn't shape Iceland from my mind. Um, so, of course, having the opportunity to come here and just study Icelandic, um, it's not hyperbole to say that that was truly a dream come true in a lot of ways. Um, so in terms of academics, I took three courses each semester, grammar, Icelandic language and conversation practice. 
Um, it's so amusing to me that an entire class would just be called grammar. Um, I think that's also very Icelandic. Um, I think if you want to scare someone away, just, just call your class grammar. Um, but I'd like to talk very briefly just about each of these three classes, just because this was the majority of my time was just working in a sort of very traditional academic setting. Um, unlike most Fulbrighters, I didn't really have a direct supervisor, wasn't really doing a research project, um, which had a lot of sort of advantages, but also maybe uh, disadvantages in some ways. Um, so this is screenshots of all 120 possible forms of the adjective good in Icelandic. <laughs> so in English, we have good, better, and best. And uh, I'm not gonna I'd be here until lunch if I read all 120 of these, but only 30 of these are unique forms. So you really only have to learn, memorize 30, not 120. Um, but these are taken from Bean, which is a database of modern Icelandic usage. Um, so if you're not sure what form you use for a word, you check it out on Bean. And so I spent a lot of this past year just on this website, looking at these different forms. Um, I also chose this adjective because you can sort of see a connection between English and Icelandic as common Germanic languages, right? Go betri bestur, very similar to good, better, and best. So there are some connections we can see between Icelandic and English. Um, my second class was Eastlands Mao, Icelandic language. Um, so we talked a lot about word formation, um, vocabulary development. Here was a lesson we were looking at how to make nouns in Icelandic um, and how nouns can be formed from other nouns, from verbs, and from adjectives. Um, so here we have the verb thida to translate right here in the middle. Um, and one who translate with the andi at the end is a translate for. A uh, greida is to pay, a greidandi is a payer. Um, and if you've even just looked at a little Icelandic, you'll probably know that this sort of Lego building block method is uh, sort of in some ways unique to Icelandic. And so a lot of words are created from these constituent parts. And so throughout this year, I sort of collected a few words that I thought were particularly interesting or poetic or just um, very fitting in their literality. So the first one is Stig Viel, which is sort of most literally a stepping machine or what we would call rain boots. Um, Hukmind is a mind picture or an idea. Bergmau, uh, I think this is a truly beautiful one. Bergmau is an echo or rock or cliff language. A viel meni is a robot, a machine man. A hrad banki is an ATM. And so gefraudr, a story thread, is a plot in a book or a movie. So Icelandic is certainly challenging, but once you get these sort of small words, you can make sense of these sort of impossibly long seeming words once you understand their constituent parts. And the final class was called Conversation Practice. Um, this was also had elements of phonetics, learning how to pronounce Icelandic correctly. So we would sit there in the basement of the main building at the university, just 15 of us, and go, yeah, 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 yeah. And it sounded like we were ambulances with siren cam in there, you know, thinking I'm very scholarly and very serious, you know, I'm a Fulbright grantee, and you know, here you are saying, yeah, 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 yeah. But it was all quite fun. Um, it really was. He also looked at some IPA symbols. So G is a notoriously tricky letter. Uh, it can be pronounced in six different ways, depending on the letters that come before it and come after it. We would look at all these rules, figure out how to pronounce each one. Um, this was certainly, certainly had its challenges. Um, and I like giving these very specific examples of just what I was doing, because, you know, again, thinking of myself as a very serious Fulbright grantee sort of maybe naively thought that I would meet people and they would say, oh, so cool that you're learning Icelandic. Um, and some people certainly reacted that way. Um, I think the majority were, were just, uh, they were more confused. They were just kind of like, well, hi, why are you doing this? Like, are you okay? Um, and that sort of got me thinking, right? When you're so in these details of 120 forms of adjectives, like why, why are you doing this? And so I've had to think sort of long and hard about this. And I could talk about my background in languages. I studied Latin in undergrad. I also speak Norwegian. I'm interested long term in the connections between Iceland and Norway. But I think the most simple way I can put it is I like Icelandic because Iceland is small. Uh, when I was living in Seattle, um, I'm part of a Facebook group. Everyone uh, here in Iceland is part of some Facebook group on learning Icelandic. And there was all this talk about a new Icelandic grammar textbook that was coming out uh, by Rutledge Publishers. It was gonna be one of the best, most comprehensive English language grammars of Icelandic. So written in English, but about Icelandic grammar. 
and it was going to be written by Daisy Nijman. She had been working on it for a while. I bought the book. It was as good as advertised. And then I show up to my first class. And my teacher is Daisy Nijman, uh, the woman who literally wrote the book. And I don't, I don't know if that would happen anywhere else. I don't know, you know if you learned a Spanish, German, or, or Chinese, or even something like Norwegian or Danish. I just don't really see that happening. Um, and that smallness, it brings around something like accessibility, right? The distance between you and someone who's the best in their field in Iceland is really, really very small. Um, and I really, really like that. Um, like Sydney, I also did track and field in college and was involved in a track and field club here. And my coach in this track and field club was a three-time Olympian, Anna Williamson. And, you know, I, I was an okay athlete, but just, you know, this guy is coaching me who's been to three Olympic games. Um, that's, that's pretty incredible, just that distance between someone was at the absolute top of their field and me. Um, so I'd like to just look very briefly at numbers. Um, but I think they illustrate my point well. Um, there are 360 native speakers of Iceland, or at least total speakers approximately. So one individual, so just by learning Icelandic, you become 0.003% of Icelandic speakers globally, which of course is a small number, but compared to English, where estimates, estimates vary, but there are about 2 billion people on the globe who have some command of English. That's, I don't even gonna say all those zeros, um, but you become uh, such a larger proportional part of a small community. And even as second language learners, L2, people like me who didn't grow up speaking Icelandic, one person is 0.003%, um, which is sort of incredible to think about. And so, as I reflect on sort of why it's important to learn Icelandic, why Icelandic, all these things, um, I wanted to talk briefly about why I think it's important to learn a language. Um, I think the humanities, I think language learning it has a bit of an identity crisis. I think things like Google Translate are becoming more and more advanced, um, right? There's talk of these earpieces that are maybe being developed that can simultaneously translate. And so I just like to give a couple of reasons why I think it's really important or valuable to learn a language. Um, the first one is learning a language helps you sort of relive childhood in a way. Um, you can't really express what you want to say. Um, I can't tell you guys how many times I've been in a discussion or in an Icelandic speaking environment and I wanted to give my opinion on a political issue, on a book or something. And all I could think to say was like, like I think this is interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's all I could say. Um, but the positive side of that is you have this sort of like childlike sense of curiosity, right? Everything is new, everything is exciting. And when you find a new word, it, it sort of just lights you up. Um, you also, almost like a toddler, you, you want everything to make sense, right? You want structure, you want regularity. Um, there's always someone in a, a language learning classroom that has to know why. Why does this happen? Why does this verb change like this? Why? You know, and the poor teacher's like, sorry, you know, <laughs> just the way it is. Um, and the second one that I didn't fully appreciate um, maybe being here is how learning another language gives you a mirror into your own native tongue. Uh, most linguists and neuroscientists agree that we have an inherent capacity to learn language. You don't really need to expend effort as a child to learn. You certainly need to learn how to read and write. As far as speaking and listening, that comes quite naturally. It's only when you go to your second language um, that language learning becomes conscious, right? You put effort in, right? you maybe learn from book or study vocabulary. What that does is that holds up a mirror into the processes of your own native language. This happened to me early on with Icelandic, where when I say I think in English, there's sort of three different ways to say that in Icelandic. On the one hand, if you're saying something you believe, I was saying, and this is interesting, use one verb. But if it's something you believe or maybe you don't have personal experience with, then you say, I'm not holding. But if you're strictly speaking about cognition, and right, if you could read someone's mind and sort of like a speech bubble coming up out of their head, you would use a third verb. So you have to make all these distinctions that you wouldn't make in your native tongue. And I think if I can boil it down to the most important thing, this process of right, realizing that other people use different processes than you, I think it looks a lot something like empathy. Um, I think learning a second language is a tremendous exercise in empathy. My background is as a teacher, and I would say, you know, if I had to explain why I became an English teacher, I would say it's because reading helps us develop empathy. It helps us understand the situations of people that are maybe different from us in all kinds of ways. And I think language learning is very much like that too. An old world seen through new words. Um, so I had to include some pictures as well. I went to a lot of poetry readings, literary events, 
um, at the top that's from the Reykjavik International Literary Festival a few weeks ago. Uh, it's two-time Pulitzer winner Colson Whitehead in the middle. Here was a panel led by former Fulbrighter Larissa Kaiser. Uh, events on the Day of the Icelandic Language in uh, November. And of course, you know, when you talk about language, literature, poetry, it helps to have a beautiful, beautiful, inspiring background. Um, Northern Lights, Sunsets. Um, here's a picture of me involved in my track club, going the javelin with Ithrod Fjellag Um Yeah, I mean, speaking of the weather, when I would train for track in Texas, we'd train outdoors 11 months out of the year. And in Iceland, we train outdoors six weeks or maybe seven weeks out of the year so it's it's quite different um post fulbright i'll be continuing this bachelor's degree in icelandic so it means i'll have the privilege of taking grammar three um uh, with continued funding and support from the arkin Magnuson institute um this is our brand new building at the university of iceland which was newly christened as edda um, which will just be for icelandic language which is very exciting for me and of course possibly graduate school here in Iceland, United States, or uh, perhaps in Norway, I have also a lot of interest. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these thank yous, but um, a lot of people deserve a lot of thanks, um, especially the Fulbright team and the Arden Magnuson Institute just for making um, what was truly a dream for me come true. So I'm tremendously grateful for both the financial support, but also just the gift of time, to have time to do something you enjoy doing. It's truly wonderful. So thank you. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think most people would say that it's hard to have like a complete equality between yeah. two languages. I think the most likely way that happens is if you grow up speaking to like if you have a bilingual household. Yes. OK. I often think to myself, which is one that I'm best at. Yeah. Is... Yeah. OK. Do use one with one parent each. Yeah. OK. Like one of them speaks Iceland, the other one doesn't speak. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, just like these ideas of heritage languages, right? If you grow up in one country where that's not the majority language and you just speak it at home, um, it's interesting. Yeah. So I think you can come very close. I think there's probably one that just tends to be a little bit better. But yeah, if you grow up speaking both, it helps a lot. Yeah. So you, you mentioned this uh, this phenomenon where where one uh, word in English has like three different meanings. Yeah. Language, yeah. Versus also two. Yeah. So have, what what is the sort of the most confusing thing where you have many words in Icelandic and English, but you have a single word in Icelandic uh, that you encounter? So a single word in Icelandic that means yeah, many things in English. I came across one other day that was we used optically for attention and attention span. Um, and maybe that's not particularly confusing, but I think um, there was a there's a good Facebook group called Malspjok where they were discussing this. Um, and someone was trying to explain how that works. And then, well, maybe this is sort of related. Another question that came up is the difference in Icelandic between manifest, manifesting, and manifestation. And I have no idea how 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 well that would go. Um, but it, it does work both ways, uh, to your point. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. Yeah. So, what, thank you for the interview. I know this is about like why you're in my um, yeah. But so far, what's the best thing you've, you've read in Icelandic and what do you look forward to reading as your Icelandic? In terms of literature? Oh, yeah. Um, or anything else. Yeah. I really like uh, Brian Olofsson. Um, he writes short stories that are sort of very confusing and sort of leaving second guessing. Um, we had, had some good conversations where like, we, we understood what it, every word in the text, but we couldn't explain because mm -hmm. someone was lying and then someone else was also not telling the truth. And so that was quite fun. Uh, Angels of the Uner Universe by Ana Maur. Um, it's probably the, the best book I've read so far. I think of course I'd like to eventually get towards the sagas, um, get towards Loxness, um, certainly not there yet. Um, 
but again, this the smallness of Iceland as a literary community is also so exciting because like these people are accessible, right? You can meet these people and talk to them. Yeah. I also really love the version of your Yeah. Um, for those in the audience that I'm sure are interested in learning multiple languages, but maybe don't have the chance to go and immerse themselves in a new country, for example, how would you suggest that someone acquire a new language um, while not relying on an actual app to go like, on, like Google Translate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So learning a language where you don't have maybe the opportunity to speak it every day. Yeah. 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 Where you're maybe not with Google Translate. Yeah. I, mean, I can speak from my experience when I tried to learn Norwegian, I just really heavily relied on Duolingo, mm -hmm. um, but also just, I think, being clear about your motivation. You know, mm -hmm. I, I feel like learning a language is one of those things that you could throw in the category of like running a marathon, right? It's like this thing that's like, oh, that'd be cool someday, mm -hmm. right? And I think you need to you need to have a clear motivation that isn't just, I'm supposed to learn a language. So like, you know, what am I do? Um, yeah, I mean, it's so much easier because of the internet. I really have no idea how people would have learned languages 100 years ago. Um, I don't envy them, especially in this language, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, for, oh, thank you. for those of you who may not know, he's learned Icelandic brilliantly. <laughs> and also the fairy tale promise from the previous slide we mentioned today. Um, in response to your question, yes, um, I'm working on my Italian. Amazing. And no, 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 and teacher Stefano is not just interested in your watching his show. He's interested in your actually learning Italian. And he points out that if you just hunt around a bit, you can find your know, Facebook groups yeah. for language speakers. So you can get yourself set up with a group of other language speakers. And now with Zoom, you can actually speak and hear. Um, and so even if you're not in the country, yeah. you know yeah. Yeah. talking I FaceTimed with a guy in France for once a week for a few months who was also learning Icelandic this past year. And I, I have different groups that people meet and practice Norwegian from Texas and Wales and like Afghanistan. So those are tremendously helpful. Speaking is most cognitively demanding thing um, of any language. So the more you can speak, it'll help tremendously. Do you have any more questions? Well, yes, let's okay, yeah. it. So also agree with everything. That's wonderful. I'm really curious and if you have had any sort of discussions with people around the future of Icelandic and what that looks like, especially if kids are super exposed to yeah. social media and being from the US and English lets me Yeah. I think it's I would say my impression is that it's an area for concern, but there's no real like no one's worried that Icelandic's gonna go extinct. I think there's been enough awareness where I think there's been tremendous financial initiative towards um, working with subtitles, especially for children's TV shows. Um, you know, I even know some teachers, they've they've reached out to Apple about some sort of collaboration between operating systems um, with limited success. Um, but but it is a sort of cause for concern. And, you know, it's there's so much English that it just filters in, especially the young people's vocabulary that, you know, it does does I do worry about it a little bit. Um, have you um, have you heard any dialogue about a similar similar vein of conversation about um, things like signs um, around isolated yeah. venues and things like that? Like it seems like I mean, I've been coming here for a while now, so yeah. there's been a really big trend. English is first, and yeah. Icelandic is second. Like, what do people in your types of language communities think about yeah. things like that? Well, at least for Malspjall, this is like a big deal on that Facebook group, and there's always like someone posting like this restaurant in Loiga Vega doesn't have Icelandic on their sign. And, you know, obviously I'm, I'm sort of biased towards the language learning community. I, I think it should be there. I think we need to make an effort to work with Icelandic. There was recently, I think, Isavia that runs Keplavik Airport. They, they finally announced that they're gonna put Icelandic above English. And I think that's the general uh, way people go about things, right? Eng Icelandic should be on top, English should be below. But I mean, these, you know, if you run a store in Loiga Vega, you're responding to the realities of your customer base, which is, probably 90%, if not more, non-Icelandic speaking. So I can't really fault those people, but I think it would be nice to have that greater sense of, okay, like it's worth putting Icelandic, even if not just Icelandic, but, but having both there. Any 
can't find anything. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Maybe the American military presence probably has something to do with it too. Perhaps. All right. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you.